Hi, welcome to session one of the eighth topic of the semester titled The Industrial Revolution Transform American Culture and Society. We're looking at a time period in U.S. history from 1816 to 1850. Okay. So we're going to be looking at, uh, so to speak, roughly speaking, the first half uh, of the 19th century or the 1800s uh, in the United States. And we're going to be paying attention in this topic to uh, perhaps one of the most significant uh, events that is going to really shape American culture and society the way that it will continue to move into uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, and that is the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the United States is industrializing. We're going to see this process of industrialization. Uh, that is going to occur particularly in a specific region of the United States. This is not happening in all of the states. It is happening particularly in the northeastern states, although uh, there are other, the, the Midwest as well. The northern states in the Midwest are to a certain extent uh, connecting with this industrial revolution as well as the farmers that live in the Midwest are moving into a commercial economy as well, a capitalist economy in which they're now producing for the market and they're going to make an alliance with the manufacturers, they're going to make an alliance with the industrialists, that is to say. And again, this is going to initiate the modern era, uh, the era of modernity uh, in U.S. history in the first part of the 19th century. And uh, what we're going to be looking at in this particular topic is precisely that. Uh, what was the Industrial Revolution? What does it mean, again, to, that, you know, to industrialize? What does it entail? You know, how uh, human societies actually change as a result of uh, the rapid uh, spread of factories and manufacturing plants, for example. Okay, how people are going to uh, conduct work, in other words, uh, how people are going to organize in order to produce what, need, what needs to be produced. You know, what kind of economic system, in other words, is going to actually govern those societies that have industries, that have manufacturing plants and so on. Uh, and, and again, so we're going to see those issues uh, being played out in the United States and how American society is going to change significantly, particularly in the northern states. Uh, the north is going to be moving towards this industrial capitalist uh, system, economic system. And while well, at, at the same time, the south is not. Uh, the south is going to uh, lag behind in this process of industrialization and instead is going to simply e expand its agricultural economy based on plantations. We're going to see that more and more what the, uh, the southern states are doing is simply growing the cotton uh, for the industries uh, that are rapidly spreading in places like England and in the northern states of the country. And they're not going to uh, invest in factories. They're not going to make an effort to industrialize. Okay, so uh, this is also going to shape the way the South is going to look like as well. So again, we're going to be looking at all those issues again in this topic. Now let's turn to our uh, outline here so we can now have a an understanding of the main components, the main parts of this topic. Again, this is the title. This is the eighth topic of uh, the semester. Uh, we're in the national period, early national period. Uh, we already covered the New Republic. There were three sessions on that. And now we're moving into the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there will be three sessions as well, looking at the Industrial Revolution transforming American culture and society from 1816 to 1850. Okay, so this is the title. Again, and this is the main theme. This is the topic that we're going to actually concentrate for the following three sessions. Um, and the table of contents uh, it shows that there's going to be uh, four main parts, four main components uh, to this topic in that we're going to examine uh, first and foremost in part one, uh, the beginning stages of the uh, Industrial Revolution in world history, which occurred in Great Britain. 
Okay, it is in Great Britain that we're gonna see uh, the first industrial revolution in human history. This is where the industrial revolution took place first before anywhere else around the world in the 1700s. So uh, the significance of this is that we have to pay attention as to what exactly occurred in Great Britain that led to the industrial revolution and how exactly British uh, society changed uh, as a result of this industrial revolution because by understanding the British Industrial Revolution is going to be easier uh, understanding the Industrial Revolutions elsewhere, like in the United States, for example, uh, or the countries that will industrialize around the world. There will be, again, country after country uh, that is going to, by the 19th century and 20th century, that will be following those footsteps, the footsteps of Great Britain, and also moving towards industrialization. Um, and so it, it kind of serves as a guide to understand that. And of course, part two, uh, we're going to now shift uh, our attention, our focus to the United States. Okay, looking at the first industrial revolution in the U.S. Okay, uh, from 1816 to 1830, you know, during this period of time, um, uh, the United States is uh, beginning this process of industrialization. Is the second country to industrialize and is following the footsteps of uh, Great Britain. Uh, but as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, <clears throat> uh, the United States is only industrializing in specific regions of the country, and that is the Northeast, okay, the Northeastern st Eastern states, uh, like New England, for example, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, for example, those states. Uh, we're going to pay attention to, in part two, this first industrial revolution in the U.S., now, uh, in part three, we're going to uh, look at the South, what was really going on in the U.S. South. While the North is industrializing, as I mentioned, the South is not going to industrialize and instead is going to expand its agricultural economy based on uh, plantations plus the plantation system uh, for the purpose of growing cotton. This is the raw material that uh, the industries in the North and the industries in Great Britain require to process into finished clothing, textile manufacturing, textile factories. So it needs, you know, they're manufacturing clothing, textiles, so they need cotton. And the U.S. South is going to start growing the cotton and it will supply the cotton for uh, the industries uh, in Europe and in the United States. And so therefore, uh, the South is going to transform uh, uh, in a way that is going to create a very distinct um, uh, economic system, a very distinct uh, social system uh, that is going to contrast very sharply with the economic and social system of the North. So again, this is going to, in a certain sense, um, start driving those two regions apart, the North and the South. And I say they're growing apart because they're moving in different directions economically uh, and socially as well. Okay, the rise of King Cotton when Cotton becomes king. It was the cash crop that really was the wealth of the South, the source of wealth in the South. Um, and of course, with that, of course, we have to examine slavery as well. You know, and we cannot talk about cotton. We cannot talk about plantations uh, without talking about slavery. And so that's another thing is that the South is going to grow uh, uh, very, very dependent on this system of labor that is going to uh, really serve as the basis for all work, for all type of economic activity that needed to be done uh, for agricultural labor. Uh, so all the jobs in the South, all work was actually done by slaves. Okay, So the entire Southern society, the entire Southern economy will, uh, will depend on slave labor. Uh, so much that is going to uh, cling to this system of labor so steadfast that it rather just uh, uh, separate from the United States. The southern, the slaveholding states are going to, by in 
1860 are going to secede from the Union in order to preserve the system of labor. Again, that pretty much sustained their entire economies you know, in the South. Something that we're going to see actually in the next topic, the ninth topic, the Civil War. But this is going to really um, be very useful for understanding what is going to happen uh, in the United States uh, that led to the Civil War, you know, the the the, rep, the rupture in the Union when the Southern states separated. They were really growing apart, by the way, as a result of uh, two different economic systems really, um, uh, you know, separating the country and, and industrial capitalism in the North and, you know, slavery and agriculture in the South. And last but not least, in the fourth part, we're going to uh, pay attention to um, movements, social movements, religious movements that occurred uh, during the 1830s and 40s uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution had an un unintended consequence, uh, 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 socially speaking, that is to say, in that it actually generated a number of different social movements uh, that in which the people uh, who were creating those organizations, the, they were creating clubs, they were creating um, parties in many cases, uh, they really wanted to bring about reform, okay? And it was the desire to bring about reform, to reform American society. So this was an, uh, one of the unintended consequences of the Industrial Revolution that we're going to see here that uh, also entailed, of course, uh, uh, a religious revival movement otherwise known as the Second Great Awakening, was part of this phenomenon, those social movements in that some people actually use religion uh, as a source of inspiration to bring about reform. It was the Second Great Awakening again. It was a religious revival that we're actually going to see here in this topic. Okay, so this is a table of contents. This is just the general introduction that will guide you just to understand, okay, so this is what we're going to actually be talking about okay, in this particular topic, okay? This is the four main parts, okay? All right, so let us then move into part one, okay? Let me, uh, let me move into now uh, part one by looking now at the British Industrial Revolution uh, of the 1700s. Once again, this is the very first industrial revolution in human history. It occurred in Great Britain, okay? Uh, and the way the British um, industrialized, they were the forerunners, again, of industrialization, uh, the kind of stages that they went through, uh, the kind of changes that they created during this industrialization are going to be quite uh, universal uh, in many cases for uh, many countries around the world uh, in that those kinds of steps, those kinds of changes will also occur in other regions of the world in which nations undergo uh, industrialization. So whenever a society, whenever a nation is industrializing, they're kind of going through similar you know, changes like Great Britain uh, went through. Okay, so let us look at the British Industrial Revolution, and this is going to be a very useful exercise here just to understand what is the Industrial Revolution, okay? So why was it a revolution, okay? What does it mean that, you know, when we call uh, the Industrial Revolution, I mean, what, what exactly this uh, phenomenon did to society that was so important, so radical, that it changed very drastically the way people lived, because it, it, that's exactly what a revolution does, is drastic, radical, rapid change in the way people live, in the way people think, in the way people do work, for example. Uh, and so those are revolution. Um, so let us look at, you know, this process in Great Britain that are going to enable us to understand what is, will uh, the United States is going to go through uh, in the early decades of the 1800s. Okay, very similar, you know, changes. Okay, so first and foremost, 
Great Britain initiates the Industrial Revolution first and foremost because what really kickstart uh, this process, this phenomenon, this revolution in industry was that uh, what the British um, created is that that allowed them to create this revolution in industry is that they brought about new technologies first and, and foremost. You know, why is it called a revolution? I mean, not revolutions because first and foremost, the first thing that, that changed in Great Britain uh, that was so essential to create all of the other changes that are going to, uh, will be mentioned here in this discussion is that first and foremost, there were new technologies. There was a technological change. In other words, a new technology, new tools, are going to be brought forth. The British scientists, British engineers are going to innovate. They're going to create new tools. That's what technology is. It's really uh, tools and the science of tool making, the knowledge to create tools in which uh, people are going to use those tools to uh, be able to survive uh, better and more effectively more efficiently in the world okay that's what a tool is you know by the way all across human history uh human beings have crafted tools that enable them to survive okay think of for example the hunters and gatherers uh, uh of early humans early human societies that were hunters and gatherers were well their tools were actually bows and arrows and axes and so on, flint stones and all that, that enabled them to hunt better. In other words, to survive, to produce food. Those were the kind of tools. Well, that's what the technology, in other words, of the Stone Age, of the hunters and gatherers, something that actually we talked about, again, you know, the beginning, the very first uh, uh, topic of the semester, you know, we were talking about the stages again, the Stone Age, etc. So, um, so tools have always been crafted by humans uh, for the purpose of surviving. In other words, whether it's you know hunting or farming, okay. Uh, the tools for farming was like the plow, for example. Okay, you come up with a tool. This is an iron tool. This is a plow. You plow the land, and so you can produce food to survive. Okay. Uh, the wheel is another tool, by the way, okay, for transportation purposes. Uh, so again, at, at every turn, when, you, when we examine human history, uh, human beings have always innovated. They have always brought forth new tools that were designed to allow people to do work more efficiently, more effectively for the purpose of surviving in the environment in this case food production for example okay food production but the industrial revolution created new tools that were not yet present in human societies the british were the first ones to actually uh, bring forth uh, those kinds of tools the that are going to really be the tools of industry the tools of the modern world that we currently live in even today, again, the 21st century. And the tools that I'm actually referring to are machines. Okay, first and foremost, uh, the Industrial Revolution was considered a revolution because it was a revolution in technology. Okay, it was a technological revolution, first and foremost. Okay, a revolution in technology. Technological change was happening in a very accelerated rate in the 1700s because what the British did was really create machines, you know, bring about, they initiate what is called the machine age, okay, the machine age, the age of the machines, okay. So, um, the, uh, those machines were designed to replace human labor and animal muscle, animal power. So everything that people did, everything that human beings did in the past that they did by hand, whether it was, you know, weaving clothing or they're going to be crafting shoes or metal works, 
for example, uh, and down the line, again, you know, we're going to be talking about, of course, food production as well, you know, growing food, etc., that what the Industrial Revolution is going to do is actually uh, replace what was previously done by human beings by hand that took a lot of work in a lot of time, uh, or it was done by animal muscle, whether it's transporting products, you know, have to use, of course, an ox cart or horses, etc. And they're going to be replaced by a machine. Now a machine is going to do that work, okay? Much faster, much easier than ever before, okay? This is called the mechanization of production, the production of commodities, the production of goods uh, are now going to be uh, done by machines. Of course, human beings are still operating the machines. Uh, they're the ones making the machines, they're the ones uh, operating it and so on. It, it's true, but the machine it was supposed to, is designed to do the work much faster, okay? so. Obviously, what this is going to do is that uh, uh, it, it, with those new technologies, those, those machines, is that we're now going to see uh, the production of commodities, the production of goods, uh, moving at such a, at such a faster and, and a massive scale, again, that this is going to lead to the, the era of mass production, mass production, the mass production of products, the mass production of consumer goods, because now the machines are actually the ones actually doing the production, okay? In such a massive scale, very rapidly, that there's so many units being produced um, every week, every month in any given industry. We're going to be talking about industries down the line in just a few minutes here. But first and foremost, what the Industrial Revolution actually did is that it brought forth new technologies. Again, it was a technological revolution, first and foremost. That's why it's called Industrial Revolution. Now, the, um, the question is, why is it that Great Britain innovated those technologies, the machines, okay? What was really going on in Great Britain that allowed the British to generate those machines? So the, um, the historical background of the British Industrial Revolution goes back to really an energy crisis that the British faced, okay? So uh, the British, uh, as well as virtually the rest of humanity depended on wood uh, in order to generate energy. Uh, let's say energy for cooking, okay, energy for heating water, if somebody needed to take a hot bath, for example, or if you wanted to uh, create uh, metal works, iron works, uh, you needed wood, uh, like blacksmiths, for example, the blacksmith will use wood in order to uh, heat the iron ore and trying to mold it and create swords or uh, plows and wheels, etc., uh, horseshoes, etc., all of that. Uh, and it was done by hand very slowly and very gradually because uh, wood was very limited. It only reaches certain temperatures, uh, 400 degree Fahrenheit, so there's only so much you can do with it. But there's now an energy crisis you know, by the late 1600s, early 1700s, there's an energy crisis in Europe in that they're running out of wood. They have cut most of the forest um, in Europe. And so they are really looking for an alternative uh, energy source. Uh, so it, the British, of course, realized that uh, there was a huge amount of coal deposits in the British Isles. And so it, this is, I mean, this is really part of the geography of Great Britain is that, again, it, the British Isles were blessed by nature with a lot of coal. They're sitting on a gigantic mine of coal. Coal is everywhere. Um, and so they realized that this will be the uh, new energy. In other words, that we have to shift uh, from wood to coal because we're running out of wood. So therefore, we have to move towards more uh, coal-based energy, okay? So it, it was something of a necessity, in other words. There was no option. 
So it is in this transition towards coal that uh, the British uh, realized how efficient coal was uh, for generating energy, that it was slow burning uh, to begin with, uh, as opposed to wood that is fast burning, so it is very sl slow burning, but also that you can actually reach higher temperatures, uh, triple the amount of wood, 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, triple. So with coal, you can actually smelt iron ore, you can actually liquefy it, okay? You can reach such uh, high temperatures that you can actually just mold iron in any way, in any shape you want, okay? Uh, again, there's going to be no limits as to what you can do with iron ore because now you're using coal, that is to say, okay? So uh, this led to, of course, mining expeditions uh, the British are now trying to create uh, mining expeditions, uh, explorations. They're going to be extracting those minerals out of the ground in Great Britain, the coal and the iron ore. So this is going to lead to, let's say, mining companies, okay, mining industries. Uh, so uh, this is something that is barely beginning, by the way. Okay, they're not really that that advanced. They're not in an advanced stage in which those are large companies, but there's mining expeditions, there's mining companies engaged in the extractions of those minerals. And eventually what the British are going to do is that they realized that what they needed to create was uh, steel plants, okay? Because now that they have the coal, uh, then they can just, you know, uh, generate an industry, as the steel industry, okay, in which they're going to now smelt iron ore on a massive scale because now they have the energy system. You know, they have coal, they have sufficient coal, more than they could ask for, and now they're going to use this energy in order to smelt iron ore in larger furnaces, larger furnaces in order to smell the iron ore and they're going to use uh, the steel or the iron in order to create machines. So the machines were all made of steel, they were made of iron, metals, etc. And they're now going to be crafted in those steel plants. This is again, this is a transition stage in which uh, from moving from wood into coal, allow them to create mines, mining industries, which allow them to create in turn steel plants or steel industries that are now able to smelt iron ore, liquefy it and pretty much put it in a mold and create whatever, you know, uh, wh whatever tool, uh, hardware or iron work, etc. Whatever they are going to imagine, they can actually create it because they can mold iron ore in any way. Okay, because now they have the technology, in other words, they have the technology to do that. So again, this led to the a machine age because most of the tools that the British are going to craft uh, are machines. They're going to now imagine that they can create. Now that they can mold iron in any way, they're going to now create machines. Machines, you know, uh, uh, crafted out of iron or steel that are going to do the work for human beings. Again, they're going to mechanize production. Okay. And so one of the first uh, uh, machines that the British crafted was the, um, the weaving machine. Okay. It's called the spinning genie. Okay. Uh, this is the first uh, machine that the British innovated that is going to replace uh, what people did by hand in the past, the artisans weaving uh, wool or cotton by hand. It took, you know, uh, many days to actually come up with you know, a piece of clothing, a piece of clothing like a sweater, etc. Okay, a, a skirt or pants, etc. It took a long time, by the way, because everything was done like an art, like a sort of piece of art, if you will, like an artwork, okay, uh, by an artisan in his or her own private shop, okay, you know, artisans had a shop in their own homes, and in the house, they actually were crafting uh, clothing by hand, but now that we have this spinning genie again, that we're going to, uh, we're going to now see that those machines are going to 
replace what was done by hand and there's going to be uh you know uh people uh weaving cotton weaving uh wool on such a fast uh, rate that th we're going to now see the era of mass production of course this is the first machine if you will of um uh, of the british industrial revolution so this is the first machine and it started out quite simple this is like a prototype of one of the first machines they crafted uh which over time year by year uh, the British were going to innovate and make the machine uh, more sophisticated to operate much, uh, much faster, more efficiently, and so on. And so what the Industrial Revolution also brought is, again, innovation. That technologies, all of the machines that, that scientists were creating, um, had to be upgraded every year. They, that, that, that is going to be the role of science. The role of science is to innovate new technologies, to make them better, okay? To make sure that whatever machines we got today are going to be improved, upgraded in the future, okay? So that's what science is actually doing ever since the British Industrial Revolution. Again, so from the first uh, weaving machine that you see here, we now see the weaving machines of today in modern industries that are far more sophisticated. They're even operated now digitally. They're automated. Yeah, computers actually move them and all that. Again, so it is, it's part of the innovation, if you will. Okay, so uh, this is a very important stepping stone forward, moving forward, because... Uh, what we see is the beginning stages for a technological age okay, in which now we're going to see new technologies that are considered new and that's exactly what the term modern is actually uh, going to mean uh, in europe when people refer to the word modern is anything that was new you know for example technology so the new technologies, the new machines were modern. So uh, the British started out modernity, this process of modernizing, coming about with new machines, new technologies that were so new, so different from uh, the machines of the past that uh, this is now going to move human societies to, towards a new age, a high-tech industrial age. Okay, a high tech, you know, high advanced technology again, uh, uh, advanced technological societies, okay, that have very sophisticated technologies, machines. That is really the essence of uh, of the modern age. All the modern technologies are really machines. The vast majority of them, such as this computer, for example. Okay, we're using a technology here, which is actually a machine. It's a computer that is like a brain okay? it processes information stores data it has memory etc it thinks uh so it, this is how far technology has advanced that now there's thinking machines okay uh so it all started out by simply you know mechanical devices that were pretty much used by humans in order to craft products so uh, the british are also going to uh come about with uh, modern transportation systems as well, okay? New transportation systems, uh, machines that were designed to transport products, uh, to transport people, to transport raw materials, to transport consumer goods. Those are industrial size machines. Um, and why this is going to be so required, in other words, because uh, what the British realized is that now that they're mining iron ore, they're mining coal, well, they need to transport the iron ore and the coal to the steel plants, okay? So how are they going to do it? Are they going to use animals? You know, that's a traditional form of transportation, by the way, uh, that people use all over the world. You know, uh, they use ox carts or horses, etc., uh so they can transport products but uh this is not really practical because you know, those resources those mineral resources like the, the iron ore and uh the coal is just so heavy 
and now you have to transport it to the industrial plant might be very far away from the mine and once you have the steel being produced uh, animals are not going to be able to carry it you know wherever those products wherever those the steel etc uh, th that they need to be actually taken into some other places etc so, so this is not very practical what we need is a an industrial machine that will be able to transport uh, large loads of cargo large loads tons and tons of uh, cargo whether it are again mineral resources or uh, consumer products finished products etc again so part of this new technology this technological revolution that the british initiate is also a, a, technolo a, te a technological revolution in transportation it's a transportation revolution there's new technologies and and it all really came about with the uh with the innovation of a machine uh, an engine the steam engine this is going to be the engine that is going to propel uh, the machines that the British are about to create it's called the steam engine it runs on fuel okay so instead of using animals to propel let's say a cart etc now you're gonna use a steam engine and the steam engine is going to be the one that is going to propel forward things like for example railroads okay uh, and steamboats okay so instead of relying on animal power or wind power you know ships use wind power they use sails in order to actually capture wind currents to propel the ship forward to carry goods to carry cargo around the world that instead of using those traditional forms of transportation uh, now the new technologies are going to use a steam, a steam power, a steam engine that uh, you have to uh, power up with coal. There's like a boiler, if you will, you have water there. You boil the water by using coal, you heat up the water, the water becomes steam, uh, and is pressurized, and the steam itself moves pistons, mechanical parts that either move railroads or steamboats and you got now a technological revolution now because more than ever okay uh, goods and people are going to be traveling so fast uh, around the world it all started in England by the way the railroad revolution uh, and the steamboat revolution but as the uh, other countries of the world are also moving towards this new technology we're gonna see that more than ever again uh people are going to be moving all over the world by yeah, moving around steamships or railroads as well okay so again this is extremely important how the world is about to change in great britain as a, the result as the result of actually initiating again technological change this is a technological revolution All right, so first and foremost, again, this technological change. That's why it's called a revolution. But the Industrial Revolution was not just a change in technology, that there were new technologies. So that was the first stepping stone, by the way. Undeniably, okay? So uh, without those technologies, it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for the British to have created the Industrial Revolution. Because first and foremost, uh, you need, again, tools. That's why it was a revolution, because there were new tools that people were using uh, to, uh, to craft technologies, okay? So at any rate, all right, so <clears throat> let's see. All right, sorry about that. All right, so at any rate, so first and foremost again technological change but uh, the industrial revolution also brought about another type of change that came along with it uh, and that is economic change there was also again an economic revolution so the industrial revolution 
also create uh, by the new technologies or through the new technologies and the use of those new technologies, we're going to see the rise of new enterprises, okay? New enterprises that are going to operate under certain principles uh, that all combined, all together, will become an economic system in its own right, okay? And that economic system that the new enterprises that I'm actually about to explain right now, that we're using those technologies, the new technologies, uh, are going to be known as, this economic system will be known as industrial capitalism, that is to say. This is the beginning stages of what is called capitalism, period, okay? Uh, uh, Great Britain is the forerunner of capitalism, okay? Uh, in world history, and uh, there's a number of countries that are also adopting the system after the British, uh, so back during this time, people call it industrial capitalism because that was the system that the new enterprises called industries were actually using in order to produce the products that were so much required during that time, okay, that the industries were producing. They were op operating under a capitalist system, that is to say. So <laughs> let us understand industrial capitalism. Okay, first and foremost, uh, and again, this is new. This is going to be a new economic system uh, in Great Britain. And the entire British economy is going to operate under this new system. By the late 1700s, you know, the entire British economy was running on capitalism, that is to say. Okay, uh, they were, you know, uh, in the midst of an industrial revolution that really gave rise to this economic system called capitalism. Okay, so what is exactly, again, industrial capitalism? Okay, so what industrial capitalism is, which is the, the, the really the new system of this modern age, okay, the age of revolution is also bringing about a new economic system. That is going to be the new, the new system of the industrialized nations of the world, uh, capitalist, capitalist nations, capitalism. <laughs> it really, what it did is that it introduced a new mode of production. That is to say, uh, a, a new enterprise that is going to be really the one that is going to be producing all of the products that people are going to need, require, consume for their daily lives, that is to say, okay? It's a new mode of production, that the way people are going to produce products is that they're going to produce those products in factories, okay? The factory will become that enterprise that is going to be the generator of those consumer goods, those products that the entire population, again, requires. The factory system, again. So this is part of this, uh, the rise of capitalism is that now under this system, what uh, the British uh, are doing is allowing individuals to own property, okay? Uh, the idea that, look, uh, we're going to actually free society to own property. You know, individuals are going to own property uh, like a piece of land, for example, because ideally they're going to use that property, that land that they just bought, that is theirs, in order to build an enterprise. Uh, ideally, the enterprise will be like a factory, for example, okay? And the owner of the factory is going to hire people to work there, okay, inside of the factory, running and operating the new technologies, the new machines that we discussed, like the weaving machines, for example, okay? So uh, people are now going to earn their living in, in by earning wages, okay? The uh, one way that people in England are going to actually earn their living, pay for whatever they need, etc., food, uh, housing, etc., uh, everything they need, clothing and the like, is that they're going to earn money in those enterprises. They do enterprises like a factory, taking a job there 
uh, be paid a wage and with that they're going to pay for everything that they need as well okay so again this is going to be a new system on the rise you know great britain is really creating this new system of capitalism this new mode of production in which most of the products that are actually produced in society are produced in factories and how the factory system is coming about is because the british introduced the idea of private property individuals can actually uh, um, buy land or you know uh, own property because by owning property they can actually transform that property into an enterprise to generate wealth that is to say uh, and that enterprise uh, during this time of industrial capitalism uh, per excellence was the factory system it was actually the factory um, all of the new technologies are going to be there uh, the merchant or the owner of the factory is also going to invest in technology not just in the enterprise but it's going to move uh, machines inside of the factory and is going to employ people is going to hire people permanently that is to say uh, to work there as well and this is something new because nowhere around the world do we see people working for wages okay it is great britain the first nation in the world that is reorganizing society in such a way that the way that people are going to earn their living okay is by earning wages by working in factories on a permanent basis they got fixed schedules and so on if you will uh, but at the end of the week or at the end of the month etc they're going to be paid for their labor okay so nowhere around the world uh, do we see people uh, earning their living uh, by earning wages and okay? the payment of wages and so this is again a feature of capitalism industrial capitalism brought about private property in which merchants investors were using that property to create factories and at the same time they were actually hiring hundreds of thousands eventually millions of people to run the factories to operate the machines and pay them a wage okay so it's a new way of organizing the economy of an entire nation that is to say okay so uh, this is extremely important this is a new economy this is a new way of running an economy that an entire nation is going to actually again uh, run under uh, the British economy will become a capitalist economy you know based on the factory system and wage labor that is to say now at this juncture it is extremely important uh, to note that um, that the factory system was not born uh, all of a sudden okay uh, it is true that we're gonna see the rapid spread of factories in England particularly by 1750 by 1750 we're gonna see all over England again a number of factories spreading very fast but uh it really went through stages uh, so it is important here to know how the factories came about initially okay so before there were any factories in england uh the forerunner of the factory you know the first experiment if you will you know in which the merchants who invested in the new technologies in the weaving machines that were innovated by the british scientists what they did before there were any factories okay before they actually came up with this notion this idea of the factory itself is that the british investors british merchants purchased a series of uh weaving machines uh, and instead of building a factory because that idea had not yet arisen uh, in their minds is that what they did instead is that they tried actually uh, lending those machines uh, to farmers in the countryside so they will go to a farmer and uh, uh, talk to a farmer and say okay look I have a series of machines i can lend you one so you can install it in your living room in a back room etc okay so what i'll do is i'll lend you the machine okay and also i'll bring the wool 
or cotton, okay? Uh, and your task is that uh, you need to weave the wool and the cotton and come up with, let's say, 50 shirts or 50 sweaters, whatever okay, the case might be, by the end of the week, you know? Might be 50, might be 100, depending, again, on the arrangement. There were different types of arrangements. Okay, this was known as the outwork system. Okay, the outwork. Work was out, again, in people's homes. It was not in a factory. It was actually out in people's homes. People are actually doing that in their own space, in their own home, at their own rhythm, as well, in their own schedule. It was called the outwork system. Okay, this is really the forerunner of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but over time, uh, the British scientists are going to uh, uh, become uh, very disillusioned about the outwork system because uh, every time they went back to pick up the finish, uh, the finished textiles, the finished goods, uh, they often realized that. Uh, the farmer, in this case, uh, didn't have the materials ready, okay? Maybe 50% was ready, maybe 80%, etc. So instead of having the 100 units as promised, they will say, oh, I've only done 20, I've only done uh, uh, 50 pair of pants, or not the 100, etc. So there was always, again, you know, uh, coming short. So the merchants are growing exasperated with the system because uh, it was not guaranteed that there will always be production, okay? That every month they're falling short. There's, that, there's, there's a demand, by the way, of clothing and they're selling the clothing, but the people are not that disciplined, okay? They lack the discipline, they lack the commitment, perhaps because they have other responsibilities. They're actually growing food, uh, they have fields to attend or they have family matters to attend. And this is like a a secondary kind of job for them. In other words, they don't just they don't feel that committed. Uh, this is just money extra they're earning. They're supposed to be paid for the work that they do, by the way. But uh, they're always falling short, again, of what uh, the merchants actually require and request. So, again, they're going to grow very disillusioned with the outward system, and instead, they're going to replace it. The British merchants, British investors, are going to replace the outwork system with the factory system, okay? With the factory system. They realize that it would be best to actually um, invest in a piece of land and build a factory. In other words, we have a building here. We're gonna put all the machinery here, okay? In a very organized manner, etc. And instead of people working from home, we're going to invite them, you know, to work for us. It's, but they realize that it will be very difficult for people to simply go to the factory and take a job because uh, during this time, people don't work for wages. In other words, they might work for a daily pay, but what they want is for workers to be there every day of the week, you know, let's say Monday to Friday or Monday through Saturday, etc. So what they want is to secure the labor. That is to say, they want discipline. They want for people to be there and weaving those, uh, you know, the wool or the cotton. They want to guarantee that every week, every month, they're going to have production because there's a demand for clothing. Okay. So they innovated. They uh, came up with a new system of labor. They call it wage labor. So what they did is that they told uh, people that, look, if you come to work for us, this work is permanent. And this is not just for a daily pay, uh, but rather this is, has a fixed schedule. It has a set schedule. You work on this, you know, Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, whatever it is. And if you come in here every day during this time frame, uh, at the end of the month or at the end of the week, I'm going to pay you for your labor, okay? I will pay you, you know, for every hour that you spend here. But you need to be here every day. So there has to be a commitment. In other words, the condition to have the job 
you know, to be on the job is that you need to abide by certain rules, by those schedules, by those time schedules, that is to say. Okay. But at the end of the week, you get paid a wage uh, and you get cash, in other words. And so you get guaranteed that if you're on the job, you get, you know, you know, you get cash every month. You're going to have cash. Okay. As long as you work here, in other words. So this is permanent employment. Okay. Permanent employment. That's what it is. Okay. And you're going to have wages. Of course, you're going to have payment at the end of, of the month, etc. So this was very enticing. Uh, this is not to say that everybody, again, in England suddenly realized that this was, again, uh, the, 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 that this is the lottery, that they just won the lottery by taking a job there. But uh, people that really wanted cash, that wanted cash payments, that didn't have money and wanted money, saw in the factory an opportunity. Okay, an opportunity. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a very gradual process by which people will be attracted to the factory. Suddenly, again, we're not going to see that. Suddenly, uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people are going to flock to those factory centers. Again, it's going to be a slow process. People will have to grow accustomed you know, to this new system of labor called wage labor and be accustomed to work there as well inside of a building You know, from, let's say, eight to six etc every day so it's a whole new environment by the way now for people be surrounded by machines and the like again so this is again going to give rise to what is called capitalism industrial capitalism the factory system suddenly again the system is going to uh, be implemented in England, you know, uh, the British investors, the investor class, the merchant class are going to start now investing in factories, building factories all over uh, uh, England, and they're going to now pay wages, okay, work for wages. And more and more, uh, this is how people are going to uh, earn their living in England, you know, people that did not have capital to buy land and build an enterprise or run their own business. The alternative is, well, if you don't own a business, okay, or you don't own a factory, that the way to go is work in those businesses and in those factories for a wage, okay? Uh, there's, again, that's the alternative, that more and more uh, uh, British uh, people are going to actually move into. Okay, and to this wage labor economy. Okay, that's part of what capitalism is. Capitalism, again, is it really an economic system that allows individuals to own property, first and foremost. Again, that's one of the central pillars of capitalism private property, ownership of property, in order to create an enterprise to build wealth. That enterprise, again, here we're talking about industries. Uh, and the other uh, pillar of capitalism is the idea of wage labor that if you do not own any property, you don't have the capital to start a business or buy technology, etc., uh, build an enterprise, that you can earn your living by selling your labor, again, for a wage. It's called wage labor, okay? That's the other central pillar of capitalism, private property and wage labor, by the way, okay? So the most important enterprise uh, of the industrial revolution uh, during this time that we're talking about the first industrial revolution was the factory okay the industries the factory system and there were different kinds of so-called factory systems again that britain uh, uh innovated okay and uh, those three that i uh, have listed here were the central ones again of this industrial capitalist uh system that is on the rise uh, on one hand, again, you got, of course, textile factories. Those are factories that were manufacturing clothing. You have the weaving machines there. They're being operated by workers that are weaving wool or they're weaving uh, cotton fiber uh, into clothing. Okay, Textile manufacturing or textile factories, again. This is central to the British economy. Uh, this is where most uh, people are moving into in Great Britain, working for wages in those factories, okay? So it's first and foremost, textile factories. Uh, the other is the mine, the mining industry. This is a different kind of industry that is also hiring uh, hundreds of thousands of workers uh, and pay them a wage as well. This is a part of this wage labor system. 
uh, mining industries also hire people for wages. So people who do not, do not work for a textile factory might be working for a mine, you know, mining coal, mining iron ore. This is a different enterprise as well. Okay, that is central to the British economy as well, because, you know, uh, this is what the Industrial Revolution is all about. You know, coal, the new fuel, in other words, of Great Britain is now coal. We need to mine it. And from coal, we create iron works, steel, all the machines of industries, again, are built from, 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 from iron ore. So again, we got that. And of course, number three, steel industry. This is another industry as well, another kind of factory that in which people are smelting the iron ore and creating steel to create tracks like for you know building railroads, for example, uh, building uh, locomotives, wagons, uh, steam engines, and the like. Again. Uh, so all the steel or the metal works are being processed, they're being manufactured in those steel plants uh, that also, again, hire uh, many people to do that kind of job there as well. Okay, so first and foremost, again, uh, uh, this is, again, another very fundamental part of the Industrial Revolution that besides technological change, there's also economic change. This is a new economic system. It's called capitalism uh, or industrial capitalism in which the way people are going to be producing what needs to be done, what needs to be produced again in society is through the factory system, again, in which the people that are actually work there work for wages more and more. Anything that needs to be done in England, okay, or any capitalist country for that matter, is that anything that needs to be done you simply hire somebody to do it and you pay them a wage or a salary, etc. So anything that needs to be done, okay? People are going to be getting paid for that. So that's something new, again, uh, in the world. This is a new, a new form of organizing society economically, okay? So uh, economic change was part of the Industrial Revolution, okay? But uh, there's another type of change that also was part and parcel of the Industrial Revolution. It was not just technological change or economic change, but also social change, okay? The Social Revolution was also a, a revolution of, in society because the way people live is going to be altered forever with the rise of industries, okay? With the rise of factories, with the rise of wage labor, okay? the way people live, you know, the social setting, the traditional social setting that was so uh, universal really around the world, most people around the world live in very traditional forms in which uh, uh, literally uh, before the Industrial Revolution, 90%, uh, 90%, of the world population are, uh, are farmers or peasants working the land. Again, 90%. So nine out of 10 people that you met, let's say before the 1700s, anywhere, whether you're looking at Europe or Africa, you're looking at the Middle East or Asia or the Native Americans, again, it, it, literally, virtually uh, all over the world. Uh, people lived, again, from growing their own crops, growing their own foods. It was an agricultural civilization in the past, okay? It's an agricultural civilization that had existed for thousands of years. And people lived in small communities or towns, etc., that were sustained by farmers or peasants that were growing food for people, etc. Again, or people were growing their own food in small communities, or people live in villages in which all of the members of the village work together in order to generate uh, crops to sustain the entire village. But that's how people live. Those were actually agricultural societies. But the Industrial Revolution is going to change that. You know, in those countries that are industrializing, like Great Britain, what we're going to see is that we're going to see the rise of an industrial modern society that is moving away from this agricultural setting, this agricultural form of living of the past, that is going to be gradually fading away, gradually, uh, slowly but surely, 
the ways of the past, those tradition forms of living in which people living in the countryside for most of the time, they work the land, growing crops, etc., living in communities or villages, etc. Uh, all of that, again, is going to come to an end in, the, in industrial societies for the most part. Not that, not that everybody abandons that way of life, but more and more people are simply leading uh, that, that kind of setting, that kind of social setting. Okay, because now what we're going to see is that people are going to be moving into cities, for example. Okay, you know, instead of the rise of cities, industrial cities, for example, that are very modern. Okay, so once again, this is a transition stage uh, in which human societies are now moving from agrarian or agricultural, you know, forms of living, agricultural communities, agricultural societies to industrial societies. And this is going to bring significant change in the way people live, the way people organized, you know, socially, the social groups that were so traditional, so essential in the agricultural societies, they're going to be altered significantly with the rise of the modern, you know, industrial cities. For example, we're going to see that one of the groups that are going to start fading away that were so essential in the agricultural societies of the past were you know, the artisans. You know, those were the people that crafted everything that people uh, consumed. Uh, in those communities, in the villages, in the towns, in the cities, uh, people consumed, you know, things like, for example, ironworks, like the blacksmiths, for example, that were the ones crafting the horseshoes or the plows, etc. Everything was done by hand. Or the artisans crafted clothing. They crafted shoes or hats or coats or sweaters. You name it. Everything that people require was done by hand by artisans, well, we're going to see the declining role of artisans uh, in industrial societies like Great Britain. Again, and we're going to see that because uh, it, now you can just buy the product, you know, from a factory. Okay, the factories are the ones now making everything. They're making the shoes, the clothing, and everything else. So uh, artisans take so long uh, to craft those products that people are simply just going to the store and buying those products, you know, whatever they need to buy. You just go to the store, in other words, okay? And the product that you're buying was made by the machine, okay, in a factory. So uh, artisans are still there in society, but their influence, their significance has declined uh, to a very great extent uh, in the modern world. They're still there. They're valued because they craft... Uh, products that are beautiful, they're very creative, they are the work of their own imagination, their own feelings, etc. That they have a certain value, they're very valuable, by the way. Uh, but people in the modern age simply, you know, don't wait for an artisan to craft, for example, a, you know, a pair of shoes. Uh, they just go to the store and buy them, in other words. Okay, so uh, the declining role of artisans, and artisans were very important in the old uh, agricultural order that is fading away very rapidly another thing is that a lot of farmers and peasants are leaving their communities okay they leave their farms they leave the countryside because they're flocking to the cities they're flocking to those towns that have mining enterprises or steel plants or factories that are hiring people okay so we see a massive movement of people uh, uh, away from the countryside. That's another thing. That farmers and peasants are leaving that way of life in, in a very grand scale, on a grand scale. Not everybody's going to leave the countryside. So I'm not suggesting here that the farmers are going to disappear. They can't because who's going to grow the food, okay? Uh, the cities need to be fed. Okay, the people that live in cities, work in cities, they must be fed by farmers. So again, this is not going to dis make the farmers uh, uh, disappear from society. But a great many of them actually leave the countryside in search for work, in search for cash, in a new way of life. They're trying to experiment with, you know, a new form of living. They're flocking to those industrial centers. Okay, now, of course, in England, this process was not necessarily voluntary in which the farmers and the peasants 
uh, whereas voluntarily, just simply, you know, uh, flocking by the hundreds of thousands uh, to those centers to take on jobs. In many cases, they had no option because with the advent of private property, you know, we mentioned private property, you know, essential in a capitalist system. You have to allow individuals to own property. Well, many landowners in, uh, in Great Britain uh, began to uh, 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 buy land uh, and enclose it, fence it. Again, it's called the enclosure system, okay? And so many of the lands that they bought or that they actually owned that they actually turn into private property, what they did is that they pretty much removed all of the peasants that live there uh, that were actually working the land and paying tribute to a landlord. They were for many, many generations. Again, in England, there was a peasantry. There were peasants, there were people that were simply living in the land of a landowner. But in order to actually stay on that land, they actually worked the land and share part of their crops, uh, part of their labor and products with the landowner. They pay tribute. And so there was an arrangement. Again, the landowner allowed people to simply live there, in other words. But now landowners uh, in Great Britain, they're thinking more in terms of capitalism. So they said, no, what we need to do is actually turn the land into an enterprise. So I'm actually going to turn this land into a private property, okay, property, private property domain. Uh, because I want to actually now generate wealth, you know, uh, from the land, okay? So I want to actually build an enterprise. And so I have to remove the people that live here, in other words, the peasants. Uh, and so they were removed. In many cases, they were pretty much removed from those lands and they have to be searching for, you know, uh, for sust uh, sustenance. Many the time, in many cases, they were actually begging. They were flocking the cities and just begging for food, begging for money because they were kicked out of their lands. They were enclosed. They were fenced, in other words. And what the landowners were doing is that we're moving sheep, you know, into those lands to uh, graze sheep uh, for the purpose of selling wool, wool production, that is to say. So uh, what Great Britain is going to do is actually uh, try to get as many of those peasants, those landless peasants, to move them into those factories. And how, uh, 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 how England or Great Britain is going to do that is by passing laws that prohibited people from being jobless, that is to say, from being poor. They were called the poor laws. So you cannot be poor, in other words, in England. So you cannot go and you know, bother people in the cities uh, outside a church, etc., begging for money. That's prohibited. That's illegal. You need to actually take a job. Okay, you cannot be jobless. You cannot be poor. It's called the poor laws. So that actually forced people, you know, to actually take on those factory jobs. They were moved into those industries. They were moved into the mining uh, industries or steel plants, etc. All those enterprises to take on a job there to avoid poverty. In other words, you know, it's prohibited being poor here. Okay, so you need to take a you know a job and be paid a wage. So again, this was again a process that kind of accelerated uh, the uh, the coming about of this capitalist system again, this wage labor economy, because now the landowners uh, were turning their lands into private property, building enterprises, and pretty much removing all the people that had by tradition lived there. And because they were landless, nowhere to go, the poor laws forced those landless peasants into the factories again. So uh, now we're going to see, of course, uh, most of those farmers or uh, peasants that are now flocking to those industrial centers, take on jobs, they're now becoming now a class unto themselves. And that is that those farmers that are being hired by the thousands, by the tens of thousands during the 1700s are becoming the first industrial working class, okay? They're no longer farmers. They're no longer peasants. They live in uh, the cities. They're called urban dwellers. They dwell in their urban centers and cities, and they are becoming a class in their, in their, own, in their own right. That is, you know, the industrial working class. The first industrial working class came from uh, farmers and peasants, it's obviously, because 
uh, before the Industrial Revolution, there were no workers. There was not an industrial working class. So where the industrial, in the industrial working class came from, well, it came from actually the people that lived in the previous age, in the agricultural age, that were leaving those lands, you know, the farmers, the peasants that were leaving the countryside in search for work, okay? Uh, or they were forced to work, in other words, and, you know, either or. Okay, so we see now large industrial cities, uh, you know, on the rise, you know, in Great Britain, in social classes, for example, like I said, there's going to be the industrial working class, industrial workers. They're the ones actually working in the mines. They're the ones actually operating those machines and factories and the like. Again, they're going to become simply the industrial workers. But another social class get, that is also on the rise are the professionals and the managers. Uh, those are people that are uh, skilled. They have skilled labor, that is to say. So because they have education, they have gone to school uh, for a number of years, they graduated, you know, in colleges or in universities, they were trained in engineering or in management, bookkeeping, for example, and then science, etc. Because they have knowledge, because they had skills, they were paid a higher wage, okay, because they paid a higher wage. Uh, they live differently from the industrial working class. They have a different status, and it was called middle class status. So the industrial revolution is also going to begin uh, the process, the emergence of a middle class. Okay, is on the rise very slowly, very gradually. So this is not to say that suddenly, you know, there's a large middle class in Great Britain uh, in the 1700s. But again. The beginning stages for the rise of the middle class is now present because those are going to be the professional class, the managers, the supervisors, the accountants, the engineers, etc., that are uh, essential in running the enterprises, uh, the factories. They're the ones fixing the machines, innovating new machines, etc. Uh, they're the ones uh, keeping the books. Uh, in the administration and the like, or there's the supervisors of the workers, and they get paid better wages, so they're going to be become a class in their own right as well, okay? So this is, again, in very general terms, uh, the, uh, the uh, British Industrial Revolution, okay? So that was the uh, British Industrial Revolution. So just to recap... So everything we have said, I mean, just to be, again, very, very clear, again, what we have covered so far. Okay, so once again, the uh, British Industrial Revolution, what it did is actually create dramatic transformations in human societies. England is the forerunner of those transformations. And those transformations is, first and foremost, technological. First and foremost, there's a new technology. There's a technological change that is going to change the way people actually uh, use tools for the purpose of surviving in, in the world, surviving in the world of nature, and also tools that will enable people to produce products, uh, goods that people require, that people consume in such a fast scale, in a massive scale, that it was never even dreamed about before. Again, that we're going to see the era of mass production because we have new technologies. What are those technologies? Machinery, okay? Machines, the machine age, okay? Weaving machines or the steam engine uh, that are going to propel things like railroads and steamboats again. So first and foremost, the Industrial Revolution brought technological change. The Industrial Revolution also brought economic change because it actually gave rise to a new economic system in which the way people actually organize uh, themselves to generate what needs to be generated is also going to change because now people will be allowed to own property under this new system that the Industrial Revolution introduced, this new economic system known as capitalism or industrial capitalism. 
people will be allowed to own property. Okay, individuals can now buy land, for example, that they're going to use to build factories, okay, or enterprises like a mine, for example. You can have a mine, you can own a mine, you can own a factory, you can own also uh, a steel plant. And you're going to hire people again uh, to run those industries, to operate the machinery, the new technologies that the scientists are innovating, and you're going to pay people a wage. Okay, so this is very essential. This is a new way of organizing society. There's going to be people buying land, building enterprises, which they're going to use those enterprises to hire uh, millions of people to. Uh, operate the, those industries, those factories, to run those factories, and they're going to be paid a wage. Okay, wage labor is a wage labor economy. This is how in Britain people are going to earn their living. They're going to take a job in those industries that are on the rise, uh, and they're going to actually be paid a wage or a salary for that matter. Okay, uh, and so the the Industrial Revolution brought another change, and that is social change. Human societies that are industrializing change, okay? And they change from being simply society centered in the countryside, in the production of crops, okay? Societies that are organized around villages or farming towns or farming communities, they're going to change to now become societies in which uh, the vast majority of the population are going to live in urban centers, large urban centers, what we call today cities, industrial cities. Again, there's a social change because the artisans are declining in significance. You know, people don't require, again, artisans anymore for, you know, buying products, you know, they're now buying products from stores that... Uh, uh, products that are actually manufactured in the new industries and in new factories. Uh, there's going to be a transformation in society that uh, is going to see the massive movements of farmers and peasants away from the countryside into those industrial cities. So more and more people are leaving that old form of living of the past, the countryside, working the land, and now they're becoming city dwellers. And we're going to see the rise of social classes, the industrial working class and the middle class. Again, so all of that, again, is essential to understand how nations after Great Britain, how nations that are attempting to industrialize, how they're going to change. They must create technologies. They must invest in technologies. They have to create uh, machines, in other words, they have to enter the machine age, acquire the new technologies that will enable them to industrialize, to create enterprises. They must adopt capitalism, allow individuals uh, to own property so the individuals can generate, you know, enterprises that can build factories or mines or steel plants, etc. And, uh, you know, introduce the idea of wage labor that the way that people are going to earn their living is by the payment of wages as well, okay? That this is essential for industrialization, you know, introduce the idea of a wage labor economy as well, okay? And also that societies or nations that will industrialize are going to see really uh, the end of the traditional forms of living, you know, that those agricultural societies with their structures of the past, uh, they're going to be disintegrating, you know, very rapidly because we're going to see the rise of big cities and most of the people that used to be living in the countryside are flocking there by the thousands. And we're going to see now the rise of modern industrial cities with social classes, etc. It's pretty much essential. So again, uh, when we come back in session two, we're actually going to look into part two, the first industrial revolution in the U.S., and more than likely, we're also going to look at the U.S. South in session two when we come back. So we can see now how the United States is really moving in this direction, just like Great Britain, yet the United States is also going to go through similar stages, something that we're going to actually assess when we come back again in session two. That's all I have for you, and I'll see you then in session two for the remaining portion of this lecture. Thank you.